Okay, so this is a good one that's going to help if you're looking to heal and accelerate the rate of healing. Obviously, you'd only ever be looking to accelerate the rate of healing if you sat there going, I'm not healing very fast, and that's annoying. So if you are looking to heal faster, this is a great tip for that. Um, but you might not like it. So it will help, it works, but it might not feel good, and it might not have a tasty flavour. Um, not everything that is good for you is immediately tasty. Not everything that is good for you feels good straight away. It can take some time before it feels good and sometimes the medicine does have a slightly better taste. Um, with this one, it's not really that the medicine has a better taste, it's that people are frightened of it because it's become, it's developed, the medicine has developed a mythical property inside of their mind because they've been avoiding taking it for such a long time. The uh, medicine that you need to take by which the physician, the bitter potion by which the physician will heal himself, drunk straight from the cup formed by the potter's own hands, for those of you who know your poetry, um, this is the route into healing that is to explore your feelings. So how do you explore your feelings and why are people so afraid of it? Let's start with the resistance first, why people are so afraid of it. I've spoken before on the channel about something called emotophobia, which is the uh, description of people being f having a phobic, neurotic, non-sane avoidance response to any display of negative emotions. So usually it's described as people having an aversion to creating negative emotions in other people, which means that they can't say no to them because they're, they have a phobic response to creating disappointment or, or anger or rejectment in, in others. Um, and then I noticed that actually people also have a phobia, a phobic response to generating negative emotions in themselves. So then they have a problem with denying themselves of anything. And if you can't deny yourself anything, you have no impulse control. If you have no impulse control, uh, then you have no self-discipline. And it's very hard to actually move forward with your life and get anything done because you're terrified, not just of creating a negative emotion in other people, but in yourself. How does this develop? Two ways, really. Um, um, they're, they're symbiotic. There's a symbiotically uh, sick relationship in place with these two ways. One is that usually in an environment, usually um, the family of origin environment, um, a display of negative emotion in the environment would lead to catastrophe. So people getting into a slightly bad mood could lead to scenes of domestic violence, um, you know, emotional neglect, abandonment, torture, people leaving, um, people taking their kids and threatening to send them to orphanages or actually leaving them by the side of the road in kind of like what I would call like a mock execution. Um, I'm going to abandon you if you don't behave yourself. Uh, you're right, you're not listening to me, okay, I'm leaving you by the side of the road and then coming back and picking the child up. I experienced that, I know that other people have as well. Um, I know it's a thing that can happen. So in the child's mind, uh, you're learning that the expression of dissent, of saying no, of any format of non-servium, I will not comply, or even something as polite, you know, I've gone with the non-servium, um, I will not comply, I will not serve, no, I will not kneel. Um, I notice that Zizek re refers to the Bartleby um, sort of injunction, which is, sim is, is simpler, more polite, which is, I would prefer not to, I would prefer not to, I would prefer not to. So even the less confrontational, I would prefer not to, can have a very severe, aggressive and violent response to it in a totalitarian state that the family, the narcissistic family unit can represent. This can happen in adulthood when people get stuck in totalitarianistic relationships or even in jobs. You know, I think uh, not enough has been explored yet of the damage that can be done to people in the workplace because where you're being held is your money, your salary, your mortgage, your financial security. Um, I know that Sam Vaknin is exploring this at the moment, you know, dealing with and coping with um, cluster B personality types in, in the workplace and looking at just how much damage they can actually do. So that's number one, is you learn that to say no or to generate any um, negative emotion in the other, the big other, could result in cat uh, catastrophic situations where you will be flooded with adrenaline and terror and be in fear for your you know, very, very existence. This then, this part two steps in. 
So then at the internal level, you have an editing system that says don't experience negative emotion and don't induce negative emotion with the people. So you have like, a, I suppose you could imagine it as a figure eight. The parental or authority figure, uh, that would be the parents, the family of origin, the partner or the boss, or just the unit. I mean, you can have a, a totalitarianistic author authoritarian units, towns, uh, churches. I've heard loads of examples of people telling me churches are run like that. Um, uh, clans, cults, sects, a group, a tribe that operates in this way. So they're at the top of the figure eight. They feed in the information. You must not say no. You must not say no. You must not say no. That's then internalized at the bottom of the figure eight into the unit, into the child's mind, into the individual's mind and goes into their unconscious. It then changes there, literally twists and corrupts and corrodes their unconscious settings to I must not say no. I must not say non-servium. I must not say I would prefer not to. You must always be in a state of submission and acquiescence all the time. That then spills back out, comes out of the unconscious, and then even in the absence of an environment that caused this pattern, if you leave the cult, or the cult just uh, disbands, or, or, or the relationship breaks up, or you grow up and leave your family home, you then seek to find new authority figures so people who are raised in cults and then leave the cult will often find a new cult later in life, quite literally, I'm using the word cult advisedly, and I mean cult, not metaphorically, I mean a cult, uh, religious, uh, spiritual cult. They'll find a new a totalitarian mummy and daddy to tell them what to do, because that's what feels comfortable now. That's what feels like home. This is how twisted and sick it is. Or the person will uh, create, manifest, provoke, cause, um, direct unconsciously a, a scenario where they can be in a totalitarian state with a dictator telling them exactly what they must and mustn't do. And they can mold the other person into that. This is a more subtle process. Um, I know that a lot of you are excessively conscientious. You're, you know, you're, you're full of guilt and shame every day. It's highly unlikely you're doing that. Um, it, it's not easy to do that. It's a very difficult thing to take a completely normal, non-dictatorial person and turn them into one, but it is possible. Uh, this will be explored at a later date. This is just for healing for today, for now, to pick up and use. So that's the figure eight. That's, that's how that manifests. One, the injunction comes from above. Two, the injunction comes from below. It, the, the above and without, and then it starts to come from within and below. It's actually coming up and up out of you now. This is what you want to experience. So you avoid your feelings. Now then, what happens after a lifetime of, of avoiding your feelings or even from a relatively early age? By the time, if this started when you were one, two, three, four years old, by the time you're 20, you will probably uh, score highly on tests for borderline personality disorder. Why? Because all your true vulnerable emotions get locked away as they must be in order to survive. They are pushed, suppressed, repressed, locked away. They don't disappear. They don't just, emotions don't just like go, oh, you don't, you don't want me right now. It's not like a door-to-door a, a -door salesman going, oh, you don't, you don't want this encyclopedia. Oh, I'll leave. It's like you collect those door-to-door -door salesmen and you shove them in the, um, the, the shed outside and then there's just a big pile of bloated, you know, maggoty corpses out there that are filling the shed up. Uh, now we have encyclopedia, dead encyclopedia salesmen represent your emotions. I, I went a strange way with this metaphor. We'll stick with it then. That builds up. Um, over time, I don't think unexpressed emotions remain at pH neutral. Um, I only have my intuition and suspicions about this. I know other people suggest the same thing. That unexpressed emotion generally doesn't create wonder and fantasticness. Uh, these emotions seem in storage to corrupt um, and they manifest as depression, uh, you know, a whole gamut of things, you know, a low level anxiety. That's why you have like descriptions like general anxiety disorder now. General anxiety disorder uh, is, is never seen without a prevalence towards the suppression of a huge amount of, of emotion. Uh, the people who do this, uh, people like me, are by nature disassociators who intellectualize, as, uh, they escape the heart, the painful feelings in the heart by moving up into the head. So the emotions get pushed to one side. By the time you're 18, 19, 20 years old, you'll probably score quite highly on a test for borderline personality disorder because you have a sea of raging emotion that you're in denial about. 
And the longer this goes on and the more practiced you get at it, the sicker you get. Um, this shed of bodies becomes a reservoir load of bodies. Um, and now it's, you start to feel like it's too late. You, know, the, you, you instinctively feel like the reservoir is so huge, so full of corruption and filth and destruction and perversion and horror that you dare not even open it a fraction in case it all falls out and your entire life falls apart. Um, so you become frightened of your own emotions and even as you're becoming frightened of your own emotions you're actually causing a stronger uh, shitstorm of emotions to, to grow within you. So then without complicating this further you can develop um, kind of a, a, an, ab an emotional ab reaction where you're no longer capable of experiencing uh, quote unquote normal emotions as a normal healthy unit. So you have things that look like emotions, but they're not. They become generalized rage, generalized depression, generalized anxiety, generalized doom. It kind of like, it just becomes this mass of gloop of nastiness. What do we do when that starts to happen? Well, um, I've joked about on, on the channel before, it's the old counseling question. How does that make you feel? How does that make you feel? And I used to see that as very, very funny until I started to do work with people who came to me saying that they, their main problem was that they were victims of narcissistic abuse. And then I would go deeper and I would find that actually that wasn't their main problem, that's what they thought the main problem was, but they only got into a narcissistically abusive relationship because they had porous ego boundaries and people pleaser syndrome. So that's where I got up to. Then I went beyond that into looking at complex post-traumatic stress disorder and that's where I'm up to now. And I go, oh, well, it's actually CPTSD. We got into the narcissistic relationship because we already had CPTSD. Uh, people who don't have porous ego boundaries, who aren't prone to emotional flashbacks at the drop of a hat, don't put up with the kind of nonsense that a cluster B person throws their way. So what do we do at this point? At this point, you've actually got to go back to the old counseling question and say, well, how does that make you feel? So when I was doing it to close this loop that I just opened, when I was doing coaching for people who were just like me, I would say to them, that scenario that you just described to me, the way in which your ex-boyfriend did this, that, and the other to you, how does that make you feel? And the answer would be, well, I think he did that because his mom treated, and then I would get pseudo-analysis from the other person, where they would play the role of the, uh, the, the abuser's psychoanalyst, uh, or I would get um, philosophy. I think, so why did your boyfriend, why did he, why did he, uh, say that about you and slander you in such a way that risks your job, you could have lost your job. Well, I think some people are just spiritually unevolved and what it is is the planet is going through a goobity gar of the chakra change of the pink unicorn chi. So they either become the psychoanalyst to regain control or they, um, they start to philosophize because it brings them, it, it helps them to regain control. If you're in the position of the philosopher and you can philosophize about the situation, the brain is consoling the heart saying, there, there, none of this emotional stuff makes sense, but don't worry, I understand the philosophical lesson. Even though they're completely lost. They're totally lost. I mean, a lot of, you, you know this yourselves. Anybody who's watching this channel has watched and probably even gotten caught up with you know, uh, spiritual, psychological, life coachy, personal development uh, gurus. Um, the people who are most, often people who are very, very lost can, be, can end up in that guru role because they get good, they get really slick at philo uh, philosophizing. They become like black belts in philosophizing, in spiritual bypassing, in spewing uh, sophistry and, and platitudes and things that sound good but don't mean much. They don't actually really help. You follow it, you follow it, you follow it and then 10 years go by and actually you still have the same problems that you had on day one because you're slippery slippering around the issues and the problem and you're not really facing what the true problem is. You're looking in the right direction but you're not actually opening the car bonnet and going okay this piece needs to come out because it's broken and this fresh one needs to go in which is more like what, what actually needs to happen. So while that happens, your, your biggest spiritual gurus are usually your biggest spiritual bypassers. These are people who have shut this off because this is danger and this is control. This is vulnerability. And people with CPTSD, and as it happens when, when they diagnose people who have alleged borderline personality disorder, 
Um, there, there is this huge a fear, yes, of emotions, but a fear of vulnerability altogether. They're terrified of vulnerability. Why? Because if you were physically or metaphorically tied up and raped, you were completely helpless and completely vulnerable at the time that happened. So of course, in the core of your being, at the most reptilian parts of your brain, you're going to say, never let yourself be vulnerable ever again. Never let yourself get into that position, either metaphorically or literally physically. I've seen uh, people flash back from having uh, their wrists held. You know, just go into an instant flashback. Uh, I, you know, I used to manage to work them out. There were parts on, uh, you know, certain actions that people would do to me jokingly or, or in a friendly way that would send me into uh, an instant emotional flashback. That's the invisible wounds of, of abuse. You can't see it on the person. You just walk up to them, you give them a hug, and maybe for a second you just take your hand and you put it on the back of their head and you're just holding them in closer. Or, I don't know, you go and do Muay Thai, you go and do self-defense training, you go and do some martial art, and some guy gets hold of you around the back of your head and you're freaking the fuck out and you don't know why. It's certain, but for some people it's all touch altogether. By the way, and I don't want to go off on too much of a tangent, a couple of you have been asking me about um, attachment disorder and its relation to PTSD and complex PTSD. Yes, it does all relate. Attachment disorder is simply a, a scenario where the child hasn't formed an appropriate level of attachment with the parent. The parent was indifferent or, or spiteful or vengeful or vindictive or violent. And so then the child grows up being unable to create healthy attachments with the people because your first template for attachments with other human beings is your attachment with your parents. Your template for your ability to love yourself comes from uh, your parents. The ability to soothe yourself comes from your parents' ability to soothe you. So these things get a little complicated. I try and make it as simple as possible, but in truth it is quite complicated. Um, attachment disorder can be, so to answer those questions out there, the attachment disorder can be, um, the, the thing that created the attachment disorder is causing the complex PTSD, and the attachment disorder symptoms that you're seeing uh, I think are better described, more fully described when taken as a form of complex PTSD, but just to call it attachment disorder is in my view completely valid as well. But when you say attachment disorder, yes, of course you're talking about complex PTSD. Huge fear of vulnerability, um, it, it, you know, difficult. Some people with attachment disorder uh, have a problem with being touched at all. They don't want to be anybody to come into their physical space. Uh, undescribable displays of rage that seem to come from nowhere and so on. Very difficult to form relationships that are stable either with friends or with intimate partners. Attachment disorder, borderline, complex PTSD. It's all coming from some perversion in the ability for the, uh, for the individual to be an individual. Something has gotten in there and corrupted the software and said, no, you may not be a person. You may not be an individual sovereign person with the ability to say yes and no. You may not make your own decisions. You may not feel your own feelings. And here's another thing that stops us from causing our own feelings. If you have a cluster B zombie witch doctor for a parent or a cult leader, what does the zombie witch doctor want to do? What does that dark triad, dark tetrad, Machiavellian, sadistic, narcissistic, psychopath, borderline, histrionic, altogether, the devil, basically, what do they want to do? What does the zombie witch doctor, the zombie witch doctor, wants to eviscerate you, wants to take your feelings, take your heart, your guts, all of you, cut all of that out, pull it out whilst you're still alive, and then stuff you back full of his or her feelings and his or her needs. So when that happens, it's going to be really tough to get you back in, in touch with your emotions. Now, the cost of not being in touch with your emotions, I see I shifted my body there to change state, to move into a new direction. Uh, new directions is a, um, can sound rude if you say it quick enough. New directions, new directions, new directions. That's called a pattern interrupt. So I just interrupted your pattern there for a second. Here's the hopeful part. Da ding uh, If you can get back in touch with your emotions in a way that is healthy, you will find uh, several things start to happen really, really rapidly that are all very, very cool. And this is reported all the time. Um, we have a course available on Spartan Life Coach called the uh, First Aid um, Kit for Healing Narcissistic and Emotionally Abusive Relationships. When people go through the course and they follow it and they do all the hypnosis and they do all the exercises, they frequently report, number one, more mental clarity. I remember when this happened to me, I was like, why? I, I, it feels like I can, I remember driving away from a counselling session, 
and being like, it really feels like I can see more clearly. This sounds like every description people used to give me of the benefits of meditation when I was a kid, when I used to do a lot of Zen meditation in my teens, people would be like, oh, I just see colors more vividly. I see shapes more clearly. I can hear sounds more clearly. And I'd be like, oh, I don't really get that from, from meditation, but I did get it from a counseling and from therapeutic intervention and revelation and from catharsis through clearing emotional pus. Uh, you see more, you can think more, you can do more, you have more ability to get on with your life because the system is not clogged up with, you know, cholesterol and goo and rot and filth. It's now clear. The, um, the random access memory of the, of the hard drive is cleared out of the viruses and guess what? You know, if your f computer is full of spyware, full of malware, what does it do? Well, it slows the fuck down. It can't open windows, it can't open new tabs as quickly, it can't load your YouTube videos as quickly because it's going <laughs> it's a machine that's operating but it's grinding through goo to do it which of course is then tiring and then you get tired and then you're more predisposed to emotional flashbacks and then you get stuck in a downward spiral and you feel despair, you go into the, as Pete Walker calls it in his book, uh, Complex PTSD from Surviving to Thriving, which is a book I highly recommend, he calls it the abandonment melange where everything just comes and hits you all at the same time. You feel abandoned, helpless, isolated, nobody's ever going to understand and this will never get better. These are just thoughts, of course, they're just ideas. It's not true, it can get better and it will, but it takes work. Another benefit is, um, I need to say this delicately, but I think a lot of people have actually warmed to this idea a lot more than I thought they would, you mature. You know, it's a difficult thing to say to people who've been the victims of abuse, you're not emotionally mature. I'm, I'm, I, still, I still struggle with that, but I've come a long way. And when I look back at things that I was saying and doing when I was just 35, 34, 33, 32, I think, wow, that dude is actually quite, he's quite lost, but he doesn't know it. He has, he has no idea. And there's a lot of silly, childish, reaction-seeking, needless provocation uh, and sometimes just frankly being obnoxious behaviors going on that I was totally unaware of and a lot of it was rooted in a kind of emotional immaturity so the process of clearing your emotional gunk helps you to mature when you mature you become more sovereign when you mature you sink back down to earth when you mature you stop with the flashbacking you stop freezing you stop flighting you stop fawning and you stop fighting with everybody you're not out there in the world wrestling with reality you just, it is where it is, and you are what you are, take it or leave it. And you become calm, and you become settled. And that, it's not, it's not a good feeling or a bad, it's, it, it, it's, it's, a, it's a good feeling in that it feels based. You will, one of the, the, the third benefit is you'll feel more based, you'll feel more grounded. But you can feel depressed and grounded. But you can feel depression and feel sadness and know that you're not going to be washed away by it. Your sense of self isn't so weak. And, and struggling for more of me, please, that it just goes, okay, I feel really depressed right now, but it's going to pass, and that's okay. Uh, or I feel really elated right now, but I'm not attached to the elatedness, the elation, it's going to pass, and that's okay. You know, you start to, you start to settle back down. And the biggest thing that we all need is you simply heal. You, you, it, in removing, one of the things that is, if you're finding that you don't heal fast enough and you're getting frustrated with yourself or you get frustrated with me, you get frustrated with the books, you get frustrated with your counselor, you get frustrated with your brain, with reality, then it becomes projection, you're frustrated with the government, you're frustrated with blah, whatever, you know, frustrated with the tree. Because it's not moving as quickly as you think it should. I've heard this a lot. When I'm coaching people, I've already, I've already worked through my shit. I don't want to do this again. I've already done this. I've done 20 years of meditation. I don't want to hear you, who's 15 years younger than me, tell me about mindfulness. When I was doing mindfulness, when you were still doing your GCSEs, mate. And I'm like, but, but, but it is necessary. <laughs> but it is what will work. I can't, there is no way out but through. I can't give you another solution. Um, and people who've not healed and not cleared their emotional gunk, they will wiggle a lot to look for the other solution. Give me something, just give me any fucking thing that means I don't have to deal with my emotions, please. Don't give me this emotional shit, let me go around it, let me find it another way. There must be a tapping, chanting, Hopi Indian earwax burning, 
thumb clicking funkadelic way of avoiding that because I don't want that. I don't want it. And you say, but this is the cure. This is the answer. This will heal you. Fine, I hear you, but it's not for me. I'm not going to take that one. So, you know, there is no way out but through. And it's really not that big a deal. Believe me, it's not that bad. Your emotions at the moment, because they live behind a locked door, those demons sound loud and frightening. Um, there's a good quote. I used to collect quotes when I was teaching self-protection on bravery. There's a good one by Winston Churchill that says, face any danger immediately before you give yourself a chance to get scared. Face the danger immediately. Just by facing it full on immediately, you cut it in half. You cut the power of the danger 50% down. Uh, it feels, just because it feels dangerous, it's not dangerous. They're only emotions. It's not that big a deal. It's only emotions. The most catastrophic thing that can happen when you feel feelings is that you get snot on your t-shirt because you cry and then the snot comes out too quickly and it goes on your t-shirt. And if you wear eyeliner, your eyeliner will run. That's it. Or you might look a bit weird while you cry, like your face will go, <laughs> like people make funny, uh, you know, once you've got past that, this is, it's destroying your life. It's really holding you back. So you get past snot on your t-shirt, eyeliner running, and you make a silly face for a minute. Yeah, you know, you kind of need to face these emotions and accept that they might make you cry, but they don't always. It doesn't always happen like that. And it is a very, very good feeling to have these emotions be expressed and felt. So how do we do that? You go back to the age-old counseling question, how does that make me feel? And you don't let yourself off the hook by letting the brain switch into what do I think about that? So now I've got a process when I'm coaching people where I say, I'm going to ask you a question, which is how does that make you feel? And when you answer me, you're only allowed to answer in adjectives that describe feelings. And this can shut the whole conversation down <laughs> because people are so out of touch with their feelings. They don't even have adjectives because they don't use feeling adjectives. So you might go and look at a list of adjectives, like put into Google adjectives that describe feelings. You know, a lot of people who've been in denial of their feelings for a long time, they split it into just two. I feel good. I feel bad. That. That is a paucity. That is a poverty of description that is unacceptable for an adult operating in this world to have. You will be sick. If that's your only problem, you will be sick and life will be difficult for you. You have to learn to describe, well, okay, so how do I feel? Like when I just described that situation to you, I guess it made me feel, I guess, jealous. Okay, just jealous? Is there any other word that you put in there that's an adjective that describes a feeling? Insecure. I feel jealous and I feel insecure. All oh, right, okay. Is there any other adjective that you would put in there that describes what you're feeling right now? And as you're trying to describe what you're feeling right now, go into your body, notice where the feelings are, have a little talk to them, see if they give you any flashes of imagery or insight or maybe words will come from them, maybe they'll say something to you, just look. How is it actually making you feel right now? You said you feel jealous, you feel, you feel insecure. Is there anything else, any other feeling that's there? Angry. Oh, okay, so you're not just feeling bad. Actually, we now have three adjectives, jealous, insecure, and angry. Once you start mapping it like this, and you break it down, and you acknowledge, it's just, it's called acknowledging the feeling. You know, the slightly more schmaltzy American uh, term would be to honor the emotion honor the emotion you must it's in you it's yours it's it's a part of you it isn't you you're not that but that is in you and that is part of you it is part of who you are you can you can i could pretend i don't have a left hand i could like hide it and stick it in a box and just not move it for a while but you all know what happens when people do that the yogis in india have, have tried that for years I just won't cut the fingernails on this hand and I'm going to hold it up over my head for the rest of my life. What happens to it? It becomes an emaciated stick and it just sticks like that. They sleep like that. They do everything like that. The thing just it basically dies and they just hold it over their head. Some of you are thinking like, what the fuck is he talking about now? Go and check it out. They just, they just go, right, part of my spiritual practice is I'm going to stand on one leg forevermore and I'm going to sleep there and I'm going to do everything and I'm just going to do that. But the body adapts to that and the mind does as well. So if I refuse my hand and I refuse my anger 
I'm going to get sick. The hand is going to get sick and the body around that is attached to this thing is going to get sick because it is part of me. I can, I can go into the denial of reality as much as I want, but reality will still be there when I wake up. It still it doesn't change anything. So acknowledge that you have a feeling and say, well, okay, oh, he told me in that fucking YouTube video. Okay, what did he say? He said, okay, step number one, I have to ask myself, how do I feel? Well, I'm really fucking, I just think he shouldn't have blah, 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 and then you go into I think and the story. It's not about the story and it's not about what you think. It's about looking at how you feel in the present moment, inside your body, here and now. This body, this moment, nothing else. Not floating off to a future, a past, an idealized fantasy. Just this one. As much as you might not like it, as it might not be good enough, as it might be too mediocre for you, as it might be just not what you really want, this is the reality that we have. You sat there listening to this video, is your reality right now. What is it that you're feeling right now, in this body, in this moment? Honor this moment, honor this body, honor this very feeling, as crap as you think it is, what is it? You do that, one of the first things that happens is you come into the moment, because you can only feel feelings in the moment, you can only be vulnerable in the moment, you can only heal in the moment, you can't do any of that cool and funky stuff if you're drifting off into the past and the future. So it brings you into the here and now, scary. It brings you into here, now, instead of here. So you're here, ooh, also scary, and it brings you into the body, ooh, also scary. I'd much rather be dissociated, but I'm saying just dip your toe in the water, try it. Get good at it. Frequently ask yourself, how do I feel? If you are alone and you're not going to look crazy doing it, you can actually say it. You can actually say, I feel angry right now. I feel frightened right now. And notice, become self-aware and notice how just doing that reduces your general anxiety by 25% or more straight away. So you go, oh, how do I feel? And you can maybe touch yourself at the same time, touch your own uh, uh, solar plexus, touch your chest, and go, oh, I've, I'm fucking furious right now. Whew, I am furious right now. I am furious right now. I am so sad right now. I'm really, I feel really, really sad. I feel super sad right now. I feel really, really sad. And acknowledging it in that moment, you start to release the emotion, you're expressing the emotion, you're honoring the emotion, instead of pushing it behind you into the reservoir, into the shed that is full of dead and rotting encyclopedia salesmen, you're actually bringing it out and going, okay, what is this thing? Ugh, it's, an, it's not good, it's ugly, I don't like the way, I don't want to feel this way. Ugliness. Um, there are certain emotions I've heard, uh, most of my clients are female, but there are certain emotions that women aren't supposed to feel because they think it's ugly. Uh, anger is ugly. Uh, being judgmental, any emotion that you feel that could be slightly judgmental of other people is ugly and is therefore haram and verboten. Um, so anger, judgment, um, what are the other? Anger and judgment are the two big ones that I hear from women all the time. That's like, I can't, no, it's ugly, it's, it's, it's not acceptable. And the male taboo is to be weak. So I can't feel vulnerable. I can't feel jealous. I can't feel insecure. I can't feel frightened. I can't feel anxious. I, I'm happy to sit here and tell you that I'm fucking full of rage. That's manly. John Wayne was probably full of wage, and uh, wage, full of wage, he've got good wages. John Wayne was probably full of rage. Um, but you wouldn't expect a man's man to say, well, I feel really sad right now. I just feel, I feel sad and I feel helpless. But if that's what you feel, then that's where it is. And the fact that you're having that emotion doesn't change the fact that you're a man. You're still a man. You're having, you're a man with an emotion. <laughs> Duh. It doesn't stop, it doesn't, it's not a reflection of anything. And this also comes from uh, cultural conditioning at the top of the figure eight, the environmental conditioning that says, if you feel this way, you're, you're, you're a girl, you're a faggot, you're a pussy. You're, you, you can't feel that because you're you big girl, you faggot, you pussy, what's wrong with you, you gay, what are you talking about? Weakness, you know, it's not, it's not permitted. On the other side of the coin, women would be shamed for expressing certain emotions as being Pro uh, perhaps it would be more implied that it's just ugly, it's vindictive, it's rooted in jealousy, it's rooted in something that is, that is corrupt. So, you know, we have these tendencies uh, to be, sh be shamed for our feelings and to be guilted out of our feelings. So emotion is used to corral our emotions so that we don't feel them fully. 
ultimately what you end up with is nations full of people who are sick, uh, dependent, confused, addicted, um, and have no impulse control and a very limited ability to think clearly because they're actually stuck in their emotions. Which sounds counterintuitive, so they are both in denial of their emotions and yet they are completely stuck in them at the same time. Why is that happening? Because if you're not expressing the emotion properly, emotion has a huge amount of power over you. Because you're, you're, it's not that you're not accessing the emotion, you are, you're just in denial about it. So you've got a perverse, perverted, um, I was reading uh, uh, Zizek this morning and he was quoting Lacan, obviously Zizek is a psychoanalyst before he was a philosopher, Lacan was a psychoanalyst before he was a philosopher, and uh, it, it, he was talking about how this is called the fetishistic split. I am, but I am not. Yes, I know, I need to feel feelings, but I'm not going to. I'm, I'm just, I, so you, you, you dismantle the process before it starts. Yes, I know I need to feel feelings, but tell me more about Zen meditation. Yes, 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 I know I need to feel feelings, but tell me more about some weird new technological format of healing that doesn't involve me feeling feelings and getting that getting dirty. I'm going to have to put my Wellington boots on and you know my raincoat and get involved in all these dirty emotions. Um, but when you do that, it's incredibly empowering. Having the bravery to do that will increase your self-esteem and knowing that on a daily, you don't have to deal with every single emotion you've ever felt in one go. That would suck, that would be difficult, but you can start processing things slowly. <clears throat> start processing things slowly. The final thing I will leave you, with, leave you with, I will leave you with this. The final thing I will leave you with is to say, uh, emotions are real and not feeling emotions is not real. When you are not feeling emotions, you are not in reality. When you are feeling emotions, you are in reality. So if your ability to deal with reality is impaired, then you might say that one of the things that is directly proportionate to your, your impaired ability to deal with reality is your ability to process and own your own emotions like an adult. It is important to be able to do that and to be able to admit at least to yourself, this is how I feel. If you want to have intimacy with other people and it's pretty high priority for most human beings to make those kinds of connections, then you need vulnerability. There is no intimacy without vulnerability. There can only be vulnerability and intimacy with another human being when you can tell them how it is that you really feel. When you stop talking in cliches and stereotypes and using lines that you've heard in movies that mirror genuine human raw emotion and you start speaking from where you feel and, how, and who you really are, not the robot face that you're presenting, then life will be cooler, it'll be more awesome and you can relax, you don't have to be on guard all the time and you just feel how you feel and that's okay. Uh, and you, you know, this whole thing, we're not kids anymore, we're not in school anymore. So if people share, like if somebody, I would love for somebody to come on this channel right now and say to me, you're a big gay. It's always like, it's always like the way we shame, like the way men shame other men is it's either you're a woman or you're a homosexual. That's how they do it. I would love for somebody to do that. Because you just admitted that you get scared and you get sad and you feel vulnerable, that means you're a weak gay pussy. Did I get them all in there? A weak, gay, pussy woman. That's what it means. Like, fine. You know, I'll be like, yes, thank you. You are 100% what you are. So well done. And your punishment will be that you have to live as you for the rest of your fucking life. <laughs> so you don't need to feel. It's ridiculous. Anybody who says that is hurting themselves as they're hurling the rock at you. It's like, it's sort of like they hurl the rock at you and just go boom and hit themselves in their own head. You know, they, it's not, you don't, you're not in school anymore. You're not a child anymore. You don't need to be so defensive. You know, we're all adults. Obviously, you're gonna feel a full range of emotions. You get into that full spectrum. So the tools I would give you, one, learn to ask yourself, how do I feel about this on a regular basis? Especially if you've gone into an emotional flashback. Especially if you've noticed you've hit a trigger point, <clears throat> you need to actually sit there. If you're in a relationship with somebody, you need to do it with them. They need to be part of the process. It's called vulnerability and communication. It's pretty fucking essential. Um, and you need to say, okay, this is how I actually feel about the situation. When you're describing how you feel about a situation, it's not an excuse for you to get into what you think, and it's not an excuse for you to get into philosophy or play psychoanalysis or play uh, uh, spiritual bypassing games. You must start by using a list 
of adjectives that describe feelings only. I feel this, 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 and this. And if you are the kind of person who likes structure, start with five adjectives that describe feelings. Get some subtlety going. Start to look at how you feel. Get curious. Don't be all ashamed and weird and guilty about it. Just go, oh, wow, I'm really fucking angry about that. I wonder why. Or I look at this and I feel really depressed and helpless. I wonder why. That's interesting. Guess what? You do this, we've just opened up a doorway for you to go through. Not only will you heal from the abuse of the past, but you'll get to learn who you are. Who you are is going to be told to you, not by what you're thinking, but by what you're feeling. Oh, I actually really, damn, I actually really enjoyed that thing. I feel good when I'm involved with and doing this thing. I didn't even know that I loved this so much. How cool I get to do a thing in my life that is enjoyable and cool now. There is a, an interview somewhere with Louis C.K. Um, where uh, he talks about how he often finds himself like going into his mobile phone or going into a distraction when he tries to avoid feeling an emotion. And uh, I'll, I'll, I'll dig it out. Well, somebody please post it here. It's on YouTube somewhere. And he's talking to the interviewer and he says he was driving along and he started to feel an emotion about something and his immediate reaction was to try and put the radio on or send somebody a text or distract. And he said, no, I'm not going to do that. And he just pulled over and uh, felt the emotion and just sat there and cried. And then afterwards, felt really, really good. There is a need for us to accept the, what we are calling the bad stuff in life as well as the good stuff. It can't just all be one frequency, one colour, one shade all the time. It's good and bad. Um, there's a great poem about that uh, that I love that I kind of obliquely referenced at the beginning of this video by Khalil Gibran uh, from a collection of poems called The Prophet and it's On Pain and it's about, it's, the poem is called On Pain and it's coming from the point of view of this prophet who's come and he's proselytizing to people and they say, teach us about pain and he goes, okay, well I'll tell you about pain and the point that he makes is, you know, you've got to feel it you want to heal, you want to move forward, you want to experience joy, you've got to, you've got to feel pain. You've got to be able to deal with uh, unpleasant emotion. And the, your capacity to feel unpleasant emotion is directly proportionate to your ability to feel joy. It can't be just all one way all the time. Okay, ladies and gents, uh, that was supposed to be five minutes. It was not. I hope you found it useful. Um, please like it if you did. It makes me so happy when I see the thumbs go up. Uh, leave a comment and uh, as ever, thank you for your time, your attention and your patience and I will speak to you again soon. Cheers.